Hello and welcome to Winchester News Online. I'm Rebecca Adeyosin and today's headlines are... It's a British icon, but who really invented the Spitfire? Controversy over student elections as outgoing president lodges a formal complaint. The problem was some disgusting and untrue claims that were made, not only about myself, but also several others. Girl Power Winchester style. We speak to three of the most powerful women in the city. I literally couldn't have imagined being what I am now. It wasn't possible. Women were not priests. The historic Spitfire is the most recognised aircraft of World War II. For such a well-known symbol of British freedom, it is surprising that there's still debate about who is responsible for its design. Was it purely the work of RJ Mitchell, or was it propelled by others on his design team? Emily Mee consults the experts. This unmistakable noise would have driven fear into the hearts of Britain's enemies. The Supermarine Spitfire became the iconic aircraft of the Battle of Britain, a symbol of victory over the Germans. But now there is controversy about who actually created the famous plane. Its creation is often credited to RJ Mitchell, yet this is now being disputed. The thing about Mitchell is that there's a lot of mysticism and almost uh, and mythology, I suppose, around him. And people believe that he uh, was the designer single-handed of the Spitfire. Uh, that just isn't true. Um, the Spitfire was uh, the result of a number of people um, under a team led by a guy called El Fadi, who history's never heard of. The Solent Sky Museum in Southampton are currently crowdfunding an exhibition in RJ Mitchell's honour. They say that the engineer has not received enough recognition for his work. In 1936, uh, that man designed this aeroplane behind me. And had he not done so, um, you and I would not be talking here today because this aeroplane saved the free world. My view is that Mitchell designed this aeroplane um, and it hadn't been for his leadership and his ability, we wouldn't have had it. So this, there were lots of other people involved, of course there was. There was a, there was a team behind him, but he had the inspiration and he had the genius and um, I'm not going to rewrite history. One of the members of Mitchell's design team was Alf Faddy, a very experienced aircraft engineer. Relatives of Faddy say that he was an unsung hero who played a vital role in the Spitfire's creation. It's the national symbol and, and actually I think it's, it's much greater than that. It, it's actually um, because the Spitfire was, was an aircraft that that um, fought against fascism. It wasn't fighting just on our behalf. And the other thing you have to remember about Mitchell was that he had cancer and, uh, diagnosed in 1933. He was in and out of hospital. And for the two years before the aircraft's first flight in 1936, he spent most of his time convalescing. He really didn't have the time to do it. And sadly, he died in 1937 before the first Spitfire was built. Mitchell went to the drawing board and produced this aircraft and it was almost untouchable. Once it, he, he designed it, it went to Eastleigh in the 36 and flew and it was a thoroughbred. I'm sat here in the cockpit of a Supermarine Swift jet which was created not too long after the Spitfire. For the Spitfire itself, there's questions being asked over exactly who created it and what role they had in it. But what is not being questioned is just how iconic it was. This is Emily Mee. Winchester News Online, Southampton. Doubts have been raised over the running of this year's student union election. Garen Wilcock investigates some of the concerns. Less than two weeks after the student union election results were announced, current SU President Harry Sampson has already filed an official complaint with student services regarding what he believes to be smear campaigns against certain candidates. <laughs> the problem was some disgusting and untrue claims that were made, not only about myself but also several others. Uh, and how distressing they were. I know that a lot of people will have seen some of the accusations about certain candidates and decided I'm not voting for them because of that. I want to challenge this to try and make sure that I can set the truth straight. Um, one of the difficulties was, oh, you're the homophobe. Oh, I've, I've heard about this. Uh, you're the person who's done that. Uh, it's supposed to be a, a non-negative campaign. People may have decided to play it that way. Um, and other candidates themselves upheld themselves brilliantly. Some other people really didn't. So I know that there were, there was at least one who may have withdrawn. Um, and I know others came under similar attacks, not only over social media, but just some things that weren't true. I never expected an election for 
student union office to be like that, and it shouldn't be like that. Well, I originally spoke to student services uh, about what could be done under the bullying and harassment policy, and I've made an official complaint uh, through the university about some of the individuals and what they put up. We talked to another candidate from this year's election who would like to remain anonymous, but has gone on record as saying they feel the student union failed to maintain a fair election and responded poorly to complaints made by candidates facing similar circumstances. We also talked to SU President-elect Tali Atfaz, who said as he was unaware of any formal complaint at this time, he was unable to comment. Until then, Harry Sampson is waiting for the student services to respond to his current complaint. I'm Garen Wilcock, Winchester News Online. A new car club scheme has been proposed for Winchester to cut the number of cars on the road. The city has a long-term problem with air pollution and this new initiative is one of the ideas the council has come up with to tackle the problem. Jennifer Crayer, Marchbank reports. School runs, commuting or a quick trip to the shops. There are lots of reasons why people jump in their cars in Winchester. But ultimately it all means one thing, air pollution. Winchester is in fact one of the most polluted places in Hampshire and some people think that car sharing might be the answer. The council is proposing a car club scheme where people will share a car rather than own one. A similar scheme is currently running in Eastley. Uh, the cars are parked uh, in a space on the street or in a car park and they're available 24-7. Uh, people just need a, a smart card. They swipe it over the windscreen, it unlocks the car, and then it's instantly available. They, they book it online for as, long, uh, for as long as they need to. The other key difference with car sharing is that our cars are much more environmentally friendly. Uh, a lot of our fleet are electric or low emission hybrid cars. So what this is, is sort of a mindset change of businesses and residents actually not even necessarily having to own their own car. If they can have this system worked and it works well, they can reduce their reliance on it they can actually um, hire these cars, so therefore reducing the impact on air quality within the city as well. I think it'd be a good idea. I think it'd be easier for car drivers. Yeah, what do you think? Um, I'm not a car driver, so I don't really know, but it sounds like a good idea. Well, I think that any opportunity to be a little bit more environmentally friendly is a great idea. I think it's a fantastic idea. I think it's going to reduce pollution. I think it's environmentally friendly. Uh, it's going to do wonders for the people of Winchester. I think it's a jolly good idea. The company which will run the service will be chosen in the next few weeks and the council is hopeful that the scheme will start by summer. Jennifer Career Marchbank, Winchester News Online. The university had a blackout over the weekend but a rogue bird was not responsible this time. Our reporter Jessica Staley went to the staff and the students doing their bit to reduce our energy bills. Everyone say blackout! A Night Out with the Lights Out is a nationwide programme run by the National Union of Students. Basically it's all about raising awareness um, in staff and students at universities about how much energy can be saved just by switching things off overnight and at the weekends. So this is about doing some actual calculations to see how much energy could be saved and helping people to realise that actually if they switch off a computer it really does make okay. the difference. And the blackout is a great way of raising awareness, but also having this really big collective impact by going around the whole university, switching off all the small power items, and then being able to show that that has a really big impact on our um, energy use over the weekend. I heard about the um, carbon footprint and like how like they reduced it by like 19% last time, um, and it like, really like I guess I was just shocked by like how important it is. I thought I'd get involved. The team were expecting to see significant reductions in energy consumption at the university, hopefully showing that real savings can be achieved with a few small changes to how everyone works. Jessica Staley, Winchester News Online. A charity which helps vulnerable peop young people has been forced to reduce its services after losing £50,000 worth of funding. Over the last few months, the community has rallied together to, re to fundraise for the junction with everything from selling cupcakes to holding rock concerts. But it's not been enough to keep this centre open. Bethany Waring has more. The drummer may still be drumming, but the battle to keep the junction open is over. And it's just, uh, yeah, it's breaking my heart, basically. <laughs> it's breaking my heart. Staff here are in the process of clearing rooms and removing equipment used by vulnerable young people in the community for alternative education, to find work or to simply relax someplace safe. 
That's because the charity has been unable to raise the £56,000 which had previously been provided by Hampshire County Council. The closure hasn't come without resistance with the local community banding together for what they call a vital service. Uh, to be honest, I was actually quite gutted. Well, I've had a um, family member who was, I would say, in a bit of spot and bother. A lot of things have happened in her life and it's just left her very disoriented. Um, the junction had helped my um, had helped my family member out by providing her a safe place where she could go there, relax, be herself. To be honest, we don't we haven't got many um, centres like Junction. So with another centre like this gone, what help have we got to provide for everyone else? The junction has been campaigning for the council to change their decision to withdraw funding. But with the deadline to find the money approaching, they have had to face the reality of closure. The re reality set in that uh, we weren't going to shut. Um, and from that point onwards, uh, it's just been awful. As I said, it's, uh, yeah, and I mean, especially in the last week or so, I mean, I've been starting to take the junction apart and move things and take all the pictures down and all the photographs of the young people and deconstruct the music room. And it's just, uh, yeah, it's breaking my heart. Basically, it's breaking my heart. This isn't the end for the junction. They will still be able to provide a reduced service for the young people of Andover, downsizing to a few rooms at the back of one of their residential buildings. But the team is worried the loss of the drop-in service will have a damaging effect on its ability to help new people in the future. Bethany Waring, Winchester News Online, Andover. It's difficult to know what King Alfred would have made of it, but thanks to recent changes, Winchester is now a city run almost entirely by women. The council, the cathedral and the university have all female leaders. Our reporter Camilla Dahl went to talk to a few of their influential women. King Alfred, once the ruler of Wessex and the symbol of the city. For centuries, the city of Winchester has been ruled by men, but just in a few years time, Winchester has gone from what many see as a conservative and old-fashioned attitude to one that is progressive and forward-thinking. Many people think it is now time for women to step forward and realise their full potential. We spoke to women holding three of the most influential positions in the city, among them the Mayor, Councillor Jane Russell. You know, and I think that my electorate don't consider whether I'm a man or a woman, they just think I'm a good person to do the job. And I think that we take that attitude to most things in Winchester. And um, it's, it's very refreshing to see that that is suddenly um, in Winchester, we, we've got a, a lot of very powerful women who are doing very important jobs in the city. The Vice Chancellor of the University of Winchester, Joy Carter, was the first woman to take the position after 166 years. And there should be a balance between men and women in leadership positions and there obviously wasn't in the past so it's just nice to redress that balance. Yes, all the way along lots and lots of challenges. I mean right from when I was first appointed as a member of academic staff and I was the only woman in the department and the youngest by 10 years and once you've survived that you can survive anything. There need to be more role models and I hope some of the women in Winchester um, today may be inspiring younger people that, to show that they can do it too. Uh, and so I think that, that happens. And also when people who are now students become older, then they, you know, they already know they can do it. And they will be more ambitious in a way which perhaps my generation wasn't. The newly appointed Dean of Winchester Cathedral, Catherine Ogle, is the first ever female to hold that role. An organisation flourishes if we have a real diversity of experience. And so for women to represent that experience in the priesthood alongside men, it humanises the priesthood. When I was growing up, I literally couldn't have imagined being what I am now. It wasn't possible. Women were not priests and I couldn't imagine it. These women are a part of the new era. They have pursued their careers without their genders holding them back and by doing so, they have inspired future generations to come. This is Camilla Dahl, Winchester News Online. While they may be the bosses in Winchester, for women around the world, it's a different story. International Women's Day, which was held over the weekend, was an attempt to highlight this inequality. 
our reporter Victoria Quinn spoke to some of the people in support of women's rights. Be bold for change. This was the phrase sweeping the world on Wednesday as the theme for International Women's Day. And the celebrations didn't stop there, as Southampton held its very own event in honour of the occasion on Saturday. Clearly there has been a passion for an event like this because everybody was very keen to be involved. It is the first of its kind. I am hoping that it will be an annual event um, and I'm hoping that other partners will take the opportunity to organise it in future. International Women's Day celebrates the achievements of women both locally and globally, bringing people together and celebrating different cultures, all while promoting gender equality. Women are marvellous negotiators, they are marvellous managers, they have this natural flair, they can actually arrange things without actually getting people upset, uh, and they are fantastic, and they have the opportunity to reach the top, and very often they just keep thinking, well, I don't think I can, but you can. We spoke to the people of Southampton to get their thoughts on International Women's Day. Uh, I think it's good to acknowledge that women have a good role in society. The fact that we need to have one is a problem in itself because that again still demonstrates the inequality of the women experience. It's only when we came I felt men is superior but to me I think we are one, we are equal. The purpose of International Women's Day was truly shown here at the Southampton West Key Centre today, bringing women from all walks of life together for one very worthy cause. There's still a long way to go in the fight for gender equality, but today's events were one step further in the right direction. Victoria Quinn, Winchester News Online, Southampton. Earlier, we heard how over a thousand years ago, King Alfred dominated Wessex, but perhaps he didn't have the influence the entirety of the South quite as much as you'd think. New information has come to light that perhaps Southampton owes a great deal to another king. Our reporter Joe Sargent has been investigating this story. King Alfred, a symbolic figure towering over Winchester. Renowned as a key figure in Winchester's history, many people recognize him as Wessex's greatest king. But what about Southampton's greatest monarch? Over 150 years before Alfred's reign, a man known as King Ina ruled over Wessex. Experts believe that it is during his reign that Southampton began to develop. Well, we haven't got any explicit written record that says that King Ina was the founder of Southampton, but there have been a lot of excavations on the eastern side of Southampton, that's by the River Itchin, uh, places like Six Dials, and the evidence that comes from there in the forms of pottery and coins in particular all suggests that the settlement was laid out pretty much in one go, round about 700. And we do know that King Ina was king from 688 to 725, so it, that's what looks, makes it look as if the foundation of Saxon Southampton falls largely into his reign. It seems that King Ina saw potential here in Southampton. Trade would have been ideal, with access inland via the rivers flowing into Southampton's docks. The boats of the era were easily shoreable by running them aground. It seems what was once the small village of Hamwick owes its expansion into the massive city of Southampton that it is today to King Ina and his keen eye for trade. I'm Joe Sargent for Winchester News Online. And finally, do you remember all the fuss about Boaty McBoakface? It's what the public wanted as the name for the new Antarctic research ship after an online poll last year. Well, that suggestion was blown out of the water, but it turns out the name has not been completely scuppered. A remotely operated miniature submarine covered last semester on Winnell has taken on the name and will embark on its maiden voyage on Friday to measure ocean data. Um, they're made in the US. Uh, we run two or three different types. Well, we'll be keeping our periscope firmly fixed on Boaty and we wish it a safe journey. Thank you for watching. That's all for today's show. Goodbye.